What a great honour uh, to be at Nudge Talk this year, uh, a festival of ideas that uh, I followed with interest and, and admiration for a very long time. My name is Matthew Side. Uh, I'm an author, uh, columnist for The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm going to talk a little bit about my book, Rebel Ideas. And, and with me, joint host uh, for this 25-minute session, is, is one of the great thinkers in the Western world, uh, Ian McGilchrist. Uh, I think the plan is I will set out some of my thoughts about creativity and innovation uh, for five minutes or so. Ian, you very kindly uh, agreed to give your elevator pitch <laughs> on some of your ideas and thinking, perhaps across two of your great works. Um, and then we'll have a conversation and probe what this, what this means. Does that sound like a plan, Ian? Sounds like a good one. <clears throat> Thanks. OK, great. Well, look, I, I'll, I'll perhaps start and I'll <coughs> yes, okay, yes. address my remarks to you. So I, I've written a book called uh, Rebel Ideas, mm. which is about the power of diverse thinking. And towards the beginning of the book, I draw a distinction between two types of diversity. So in, in, in the modern world today, uh, I think you'll agree, we tend to think about diversity, which is a buzz topic at the moment, in demographic terms, yeah. differences in race and gender and social class. Exactly. I, I try and focus on cognitive diversity, differences in insight and perspective and information uh, and the heuristics that we deploy, consciously or otherwise, to, to filter information and to reason through problems. I'll perhaps say at the outset, Ian, that I, I think in many contexts there's an intimate link between demographic and cognitive diversity, if, mm -hmm. I, if I may put it that way, mm -hmm. because our different demographic backgrounds shape the way we reason shape the way we think through problems. So to, to use a slightly uh, simplistic example, and, and quite an appropriate example given where we are, if you imagine putting together an advertising team to come up with a creative campaign to connect with a broad demographic of consumers, if everybody in the creative team came from exactly the same demographic background, yeah. they would probably lack the tacit knowledge to Absolutely. connect that campaign with those consumers whose lives are very different from their own. You know, if they were all uh, white, middle-aged, middle-class, private school educated Oxbridge graduates, of course, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> nothing wrong with that background. But if 100 yes. percent, they're yes. just going to be too narrow in yeah. coming up with really great creative ideas yeah. that can make that campaign work. And you would expect that different constituencies would think differently because we are not atomistic. We, are, we grow out of a culture. Pre pre precise. We have a have a context. I, yep. I, I, exactly. Although I wonder if you'd agree with this sort of secondary claim. I think it's fair to say that there are some contexts where the link between demographic diversity and true cognitive diversity are less significant. Mm -hmm. So to, to give one again slightly simplistic uh, example, designing an aircraft engine. Yeah. You, you clearly it's a multi-dimensional complex problem. And I would suggest that you need cognitive diversity, perhaps people with backgrounds in materials and in aerodynamics and related disciplines. But my sense is that doesn't map quite so obviously onto demographic differences. You know, the fact that I happen Agreed. to be uh, yeah. mixed race, I, I don't know if you know, I'm half Pakistani, half Welsh. It's quite an unusual combination. <laughs> um, but the fact that I had a distinctive set of experiences as a, as a mixed race boy might give me tremendous insights into intelligence Indeed. or to various other human facing yep. activities but i'm not sure it's giving me any germane insights into how tweaking the design of the engine might improve its aerodynamism yeah. it's just not a clear correlation it may have longer term implications mm. people from my background thriving in the domain of engineering sends a signal to the next generation that they can do the same and i want to acknowledge that but it's not really helping the short term engineering problem and the reason I say that, Ian, is my own sense in the, in the corporate world is it is a profound strategic mistake to reduce diversity to a box-ticking exercise based on demography alone. Absolutely. I think that there is a lot more subtlety and power uh, in this thing. And what I'll do in my last uh, minute and a half before <laughs> perhaps uh, throwing over to you, Ian, is, is just give one example of what I think optimising cognitive diversity is all about. Do you have any interest, and in, in, don't worry if you don't, in, in, in football? Not a lot, I have to admit, Matthew. No. <laughs> well, well, Not a lot. But I, the England men's football team, Gareth Southgate, yes. the manager, yes. the waistcoat wearer. Right. Um, I sit on a group that advises him on performance. Mm. But it's quite an eclectic group, because also on the group is a guy called Dave Brailsford, 
mm -hmm. who's not a football coach, he's a cycling coach. Right. And Manoj Badali, who's an AI person. Uh, Lucy Giles, who runs the Sandhurst Military Training Academy. Mm. Uh, Michael Barber, who's an educationalist. What fascinated me is when it leaked the identity of this advisory group is football insiders were horrified. Mm. Uh, football insiders were yes, horrified, yes, forgive me, football insiders. You know, how dare these people come in mm. from outside the game and tell us what we should be doing? You know, why isn't Southgate advised yeah. like all previous yeah. England football managers by good old-fashioned English football men? Yes. Harry Redknapp, for example, who's an English-based football manager, why is he not in this setup? And of course, Redknapp knows a lot about football, and yes. Tony Pulis and Sam Allardyce, and they know more about football than I do, or Dave Brailsford or Lucy Giles, but the problem when it comes to creativity and innovation is Southgate already knows, broadly speaking, what they know. They were socialised into the, as you made clear, into a context, mm. how to set up tactically, how to recover. Mm. You know, that is an echo chamber. It's yes. not an innovative, creative team. They're agreeing all the time. Mm. It's probably comfortable, yeah. uh, rather clubbable. Yeah. But they're way too narrow, I, I would suggest, on the assumption. And what's fascinated me about the group that I sit on is when somebody offers an idea not known by the others in the group, like you know, Brailsford might talk about how big data sets in cycling enable you to tailor a diet for the specific metabolism, gut microbiome of an athlete, rather than using standardized dietary guidelines, like when I was playing table tennis, complex carbohydrates, and that improves cardiovascular endurance, recovery from injury. That's divergent thinking, the cross-pollination of ideas, and I'll just finish with this. I, th I think that cognitive diversity is a mission-critical attribute in the post-pandemic age, which is changing fast and is highly complex. My sense is it is under-optimized in many organizations. And I think getting that right not only has great social and moral implications by bringing a wider array of talent into great institutions, but also provides a performance cutting edge, particularly on creativity and innovation, yeah, yeah. that is so important. Yes, while you were uh, talking about uh, designing um, a, a, an aircraft, I was thinking of the extraordinary insight that somebody had. You'd think designing a, a plane, one of the first things is it must be stable. But the designers of the Eurofighter created a plane that's deliberately unstable, because only a plane that has that degree of recoverable instability, instability is capable to maneuver at speed in the way that they wanted it to as a fighter plane. Uh, somebody in there had an extraordinary moment of insight. Yes. So, That's brilliant. Yes, I mean, what you're saying, of course, is, um, it, it is quite relevant to my work. I, I've been for 30 years engaged in researching differences between the two brain hemispheres. If any of you in the audience think that you know about this topic, please forget everything you've been told, because it will all be wrong. Um, this was a subject that is said to be debunked and rubbished a long time ago. But in fact, if you look at it calmly and scientifically, there's a massive wave of, 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 of information and differences between the two hemispheres. And you can't just say uh, we're going to ignore it. So I've done that unpopular thing <laughs> and published uh, two books about... Ten years ago, The Master and His Emissary, and about six months ago, The Matter with Things. And what I'm really emphasising there is that the two brain hemispheres attend to the world in different ways and therefore bring to our attention a world that has different characteristics. So the left hemisphere's world will end up being, because it's a very narrow, narrowly um, uh, targeted beam of attention, which gives you precise information about a detail, but it produces a world made up of fragments. And these fragments are static, isolated, disembodied. They have no unique qualities. They just live in categories. Um, and, and they are basically inanimate. And you've got to recognize that at the same time, the right hemisphere is delivering a world which is quite the opposite of this. It's extensive, it's fluid, it's interconnected, it's animate, it's context changes everything, it can understand implicit meaning, the left hemisphere understands really explicit meaning. So the whole richness that we prize in, uh, in the arts, in, in, in drama, in poetry, in music, and all these things, is left out from an explicit account of what one's thinking. So what I've suggested in these books is, in the first book I suggested that this was something that had come upon us rather recently uh, in terms of the overall history, i.e. about the last couple of hundred years. 
um, and th that we have become focused on the way the left hemisphere sees the world at the expense of what the right hemisphere tells us. Uh, the, part of the reason for that is that when you live in a... You're not living life headlong, but you're stopping and considering and being philosophical. You find that when you have what are called paradoxes, things that seem to be true at the same time but are apparently opposed, we think that can't be right. One of them must be got rid of. And that's how the left hemisphere creates a very simple, serial, analytic model, which is fine. It does some work. But unless that is taken back into the, the much greater cognizance of the right hemisphere, which can see the whole picture, we get stuck. And in the later book, I explore the philosophical consequences for that, of how we think about one another, what we are as human beings, what the world is, and how the two relate. So when it comes to things like creativity, the left hemisphere's insistence that things must be clear-cut, must be either or, must be black and white, uh, is obviously a disadvantage, because the, you have to inhabit a, 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 a place where, at the moment, nothing is certain and clear. Where things where you are aware that something may be quite unusual, that's unlike anything you've experienced before, has unique qualities. You have to be able to see how things fit together in a broader picture, not just this isolated, um, siloed piece of knowledge that you're dealing with. You need to be able to be happy with the fact that we can only partly ever know anything. Uh, and so, and if the left hemisphere is busy dictating the way we do, you must tick these boxes, you must do it in an explicit serial manner, um, you will not be very creative. And I think actually that, well, there's a lot of talk about creativity now. I think we are less crea creative than we were, say, 50 or 60 years ago. And I, I put that down partly to the fact that our mindset is this mechanical reductionist way of thinking that, that is stale and dead and doesn't tell you anything new. You re uh, express the things you already know. To make the leap to something new, you need this open, receptive attention of the right hemisphere, which is willing to say, This might be something I've never seen before and it might be important. It's also willing to accept that there are no anomalies that don't fit in with the broad um, model we have. Um, the left hemisphere wants to deny either that those anomalies exist or that they're important. But the right hemisphere is saying, actually, hang on, there's probably something very important here. And paying attention to that is how the great shifts in scientific thinking have occurred, as well as the great movements in the history of ideas generally across a, um, a society and a people. That's, that's wonderful and very difficult, I think, uh, to summarise the richness of what you say. Because I, I know a lot of effort came into to trying to, as it were, uh, reduce it. Uh, if I can use that term, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, in, 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 into a perfectly formed five-minute sequence. Let me just ask you one, one question. You mentioned towards the end of your remarks about the history of science and how we've had a great deal of innovation since the scientific revolution. I wonder if people listening in will think of science, particularly Western science, as breaking complex holes into parts, thinking about the relationship between parts, the properties of parts, using data uh, to measure... I think some people do think of, of Western science as reductionistic in, in a good way. How would you respond to that sort of light challenge to what you've said? Well, I don't think it's a challenge at all. I don't deny that these processes are important. But there needs to be a reciprocity between this way of thinking and a much broader a more alive way of thinking, more open to intuitive understanding, to seeing what psychologists call a gestalt, which is an overall shape that is greater than any of the parts when you look at the thing analysed into parts. So that's, that's the balance. And in fact, I, in, in brief, I believe that everything that we understand comes to us first to this open receptivity of the right hemisphere, not trying to close it down to something, oh yes, I know what that is, but having a look at it. It then gets processed by the left hemisphere, taken apart, bits put into categories, and the left hemisphere says, I know what that is. But then there's a very important part of that process. You often stop there and say, well, the world seems to be a heap of fragments. I have no idea. It doesn't seem to have any meaning at all. It's just chaotic. But if you allow the right hemisphere with its understanding to take over this in the, broad, in the broader picture, then it starts to come alive again. And an, an analogy that I use is 
with learning a piece of music. At first, you're interested in and attracted to the piece of overall. You start to try and play it. You soon find you have to break it up and play it many times to get the fingering right at bar, whatever it is, and you see something about the way the thing progresses harmonically. But when you go out onto the stage to perform, you must forget all that. And it's not been wasted time. It's terribly important time, just as that analytic mode you were referring to in science is terribly important, but it needs to lead back to a vision of the whole, and if it doesn't, it's not really meaning very much at all. Well, I wonder if there's a connection there with my old world of sport. I, as you know, was a British table tennis number one for 10 yeah. years. Don't call it ping pong, by the way. We get very offended. Makes it sound like a jumped up parlour game, roughly equivalent to tiddlywinks. Um, as we all know, it's a globally competitive. But when you're learning table tennis, you often need to think very carefully about the arc of the wrist when you're hitting the ball. Yeah. And coaches will deconstruct yes. table tennis into lots of different component parts as you build up uh -huh. the explicit awareness of how to execute the different parts. One of the problems when you play on the very big stage, as I did at the Olympic Games in Sydney in 2000, when you play table tennis at a high level, you don't want to be thinking of these components because it's way too complex to manage. You want to be playing seamlessly. And the skill migrates from, uh, I'll get the terminology wrong, but the prefrontal cortex to related areas in, in other systems. Um, but when you're under pressure, and you're very keen to get the ball on the table, it's very easy to explicitly think about how am I moving my back because I want to get the ball on the table. And, of course, the gestalt yes. falls apart at exactly. that point. And, and we, we describe this in sport as choking. I know, yes, yes. And in my latest book, The Matter With Things, I take examples of a, a racehorse trainer and his ability to assess over a matter of a few seconds whether That's this right. horse will win a race or That's not. Right. And the... The physician who looks after the motorcyclists who take part in the TT races on the Isle of Man, the most dangerous sporting event yes. in the world, <laughs> in which people race at speeds up to and over 200 miles an hour on ordinary roads <laughs> um, with potholes and drain covers and have to take steep corners. What, what re is revealed by that is if they think at all in that explicit analytic way, they simply fail. Right. It's actually dangerous. Right. Oh, yeah. They have to have internalised information and they're taking everything in at the periphery, yes. using um, mainly their right hemisphere to, yes. to assess things. They describe them being aware of, of, of tiny elements in the broad picture, yes. but not focusing on them at all. Yeah. Uh, because if they do, then they'll fall off. And it's interesting, the terminology we use often in sport is the zone. Yes. When there's this seamless interaction between the self and the world, you almost melt into yes. the external reality, and it's a beautiful thing. Didn't happen often in my table tennis career, I have to say. <laughs> but, but perhaps, like, trying to fuse what we've been saying today, I was thinking about how we can look at the world one bit of a time mm. and miss the big picture. Absolutely. And I wonder if we sometimes do that when we're trying to come up with great creative ideas mm. in the following sense, Ian that if you took a team of 10 people and you say, right, let's try and come up with some great ideas for the future, and each one of these 10 people comes up with a genuinely brilliant idea and you're trying to take four or five to market, you might think with 10 in the team, 10 genuinely brilliant ideas, you've got 10 brilliant ideas. But if these people were socialised through a similar process, perhaps worked under the same professor at the same university, they happen to think about the world in very similar ways, use similar heuristics to reason through problems, and they come up with the same idea as one another, mm. you've only got one. Mm. All it takes is one person to think differently to the group, and you've potentially doubled your creative idea output. And, and, and my sense is you can therefore have two teams of ten people of equal talent mm. if we measure talent by creative yes, idea yes. output in this case. And if HR departments are hiring people on the basis of individual talent, this person's talented, this... Even if that tool is rigorous, the more diverse team, if each of these ten is coming up with a different idea for one, one another, is almost a thousand percent more creative. That is not attributable to any one person in the diverse group. It is an emergent phenomenon Absolutely. that emerges at the gestalt. Yes. So yes. I, it seems to me that there are lessons both in, in yes. your work for individuals yes. about getting a better balance between left and right, both of which are important, but also perhaps for corporations looking to innovate. Well, I'm drawing attention to the fact that people do uh, sometimes largely prioritise 
a, a way of looking at things, either in a very reductionist, narrow-focused, analytic way, which is a valuable piece of work, or are able to make um, distant connections, see how things fit together, and come to a, an intuitively rich insight. But what we do know is that it's quite an effective telling people to be creative. I mean, this actually closes everything <laughs> yes, down. Yes. What happens when you're stressed is that your left hemisphere recruits very tight um, networks of neurons that are largely self-referring, and it blocks out the possibility of that something coming that you feel is there coming into being for you. So anything that takes that kind of pressure off people is, is what's required. The difficulty is nowadays is that we cannot see that by not monitoring and not over-controlling, we may indeed have some, some pieces of work that go nowhere, but we will get the really creative ones that we want. Whereas if you over-control, micromanage and put pressure on, you will not get any good results. You, 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 in other words, nothing is risk-free in life. Yes. And it's not accepting risk that is so, you know, dangerous. Would you draw a distinction on that, on, on, on risk and having a tolerance for failure in the innovation space? I was thinking of a conversation I should perhaps say to, to the audience that Ian and I met through a very dear mutual friend called John Cleese, who is a big admirer of your work and I think you reciprocate towards his, as I do. Uh, you had the most wonderful conversation with him in London that I and Rory Sutherland, who I know many of you know and big fans of, as are we, um, was also at. And he was talking uh, very eloquently about this tolerance for failure and not to narrow and to put pressure on the creative process. Do, do, do you have any reflections about the conversation with John? I thought it was a marvellous conversation because, of okay. course, if you think about the history of British culture, mm. Life of Brian, Monty Python, mm. Faulty Towers, I think in a poll of expert TV critics at the turn of the century, you know, there were three of them were in the top ten oh, of the best television programmes. I mean, he's a, a true yes. uh, innovator. He yeah. is, and he's also, of course, um, uh, 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 has a wonderfully richly furnished intellectual mind. Um, a man trained in physics and the law. He's not, right. not, not just a comedian. Yes, yes. So we always um, have a great time when we get together, even if it's over Zoom, but so much better when one can sit next to a person you're talking to. There's, there are all sorts of advantages to that, and it became obvious to both of us in doing that. But if, I, if you think about what I'm... Uh, what I've been saying about certain kinds of style, the Monty Python humour is effectively being able to make very broad connections that nobody would normally make at all, to being able to convey things that are implicit. Of course, if you explain humour, it becomes terribly dull and loses its power, much as if you explain a poem, it ceases to have its power on you as a poem. So he is a master of the art of implying, of seeing broad connections, of leaving areas of uncertainty for one to inhabit as the listener or the viewer. Let me, what, one, let me just throw this into the mix. I think there is a certain type of innovation which is more incremental. If mm. you imagine, there's a concept called marginal gains yeah. that is very familiar in sport, where you break down the problem of winning a bike race into all of its component parts and then try and improve each by a very small amount and you get a big cumulative effect, like the bike design and right, using okay. antibacterial hand gel, uh, taking pillows from stage to stage yeah. to improve yeah. sleep quality. You're talking about innovation of a more path breaking kind, where you're yeah. taking ideas from completely different contexts or yeah. silos or subject specialisms yes. and connecting them in a way to, you know, like perhaps, forgive me, wheels and suitcases. Mm. It took a long time to bring wheels onto luggage and this was a problem that seemed to be out there waiting to be solved, but it took people from two different disciplines yeah. to come together as a, the, the steam engine would be another great example of that would, would, would it be fair to draw a distinction between these two kinds of innovation yes it would and we know from psychological studies of people solving problems that broadly speaking there are two ways of arriving at this you can either do it sequentially and people have a vague feeling that they may be getting warm um, but they are slower and often don't achieve that end. And there's another group who 
for a long time may feel quite cold in terms of am I near the... And then suddenly they will go. Yes. And they are the ones that produce the really yes. important results. So I, mean, I, I've spent a lot of time looking at the ways in which the great mathematicians and great scientists reach their discoveries, and they almost never reach them through what's called the scientific model, uh, the scientific method. Uh, of course, some of that had to go on at some stage, but there are areas... There are periods of time when early in the creative process when you need to do some explicit conscious thinking. I, it, that's like preparing the bed for a plant. Then there is the, the period of incubation, which is when you don't keep pulling the plant up to see how it's doing because it will never have a plant. So you leave it alone, having prepared the ground. And finally, there's illumination when the flowers come out. Yes. And that's totally unconscious, that moment. It's wonderful. And, and uh, I can't quite believe that our 25 minutes is already up. I've got my timer on the table and I'm... Time is, is not really sad. <laughs> yeah, I am, I am. I could have gone for, but that's a good way to finish is with Karl Popper, uh, yeah. a wonderful philosopher of science, uh, 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 John Cleese, uh, one of his intellectual heroes, who mm. talked about science as a bold, imaginative discipline. Exactly. Uh, and I think that really captures a lot of what we've been saying today. It's been a huge honour and pleasure, Ian, to, to chat and, and to share with you. And thank you very much. And for me, Matthew, thank you. Just one favour. If you want to keep NudgeDoc free, click the like button because the algorithm likes it and click the subscribe button too. The algorithm likes that and unlike the like button, it's actually useful because you'll get notified of future content from NudgeDoc whenever it becomes available.